his, his buns to join. All right, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, I think I think almost everyone has joined, so we'll just start it from now. Uh, I'm Tech, and together with together with my partners Priyat and John, we are really excited to bring to you this computer vision workshop, and we're looking forward to share with you guys more about computer vision. So our workshop overview will con uh, will consist of firstly some theory with high CD, because it's important for us to understand the theory before we apply it. Then we'll be doing a short demo on on Metapipe. Followed by a quiz and then a QA session where you guys can just raise up any queries or anything you guys like to clarify then. But if you, if you like to raise up during the session itself, you can just drop in the text uh, in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them towards the end of the session. All right, let's start with the theory of high CV. So CV is everywhere in, in today's world. It appears in our face ID on our phone, Apple Face ID, and it appears in the smart access validation system that we see in NUS. And the theory behind both of these two is is rather straight, uh, is rather similar. They both they both are fundamentally classification models. So Apple Face ID essentially classifies whether the person that's looking at the phone is the owner of the phone or not. And the and the, and uh, and the AI goes through a, a whole bunch of neural networks and detections to output a boolean output to see whether one or zero to detect whether the person that's trying to access the phone is actually the owner of the phone. And if it is the owner of the phone, the AI will send out a signal and the phone will be unlocked. And regarding the smart access validation system, some of us may have seen it around in NUS. It's generally placed outside the outside the female washrooms in NUS to detect any unauthorized entries into the bathroom. And again, this is fundamentally a classification model. It classifies whether the person entering the bathroom is a male or a female. So there are four really four, four main key components of computer vision. Uh, all the computer vision's models are fundamentally the same. They all possess these four key components. First of all, data collection. Every model is based on how um, every model is as strong as the data that you provide it. And it's important that we provide good data for the model so that the model can train on this data and be able to output an accurate, an accurate response. Secondly, pre-processing. -pre -pre Not every model can, in can input images of any different forms and shapes. It's important that we clean and prepare the data such that we can pump to the model. Whether this is in the form of resizing, filtering out any nonsense in the image or, or any other, uh, or etc. Thirdly, object detection and recognition. The algorithm in the model will have to run through this inputted image and output a mathematical output for it to identify and classify these objects. And last but not least, this is the, uh, the interpretation and decision making. This is in the hands of the user of the model who decides based on the model output on how we can interpret this uh, how we can interpret the output and make decisions based on it. And at the, at, the whole part, at the end of the day, the whole point of computer vision is to mimic our human vision 
and to allow the computer vision model to recognize patterns, objects, or environments around our world. Yeah, so the end of the day, it's supposed to serve as a, another pair of eyes, perhaps a more sharper version of eyes that can, that, that can identify objects or recognize things more efficiently than your average human. And there are three main types of computer vision models, classifications. So as you can see in this image right here, we are classifying this object in the in image as a cat. And in, in, the, in the example I bring up earlier, to classify as a human, as a male or a female. Second of all, detection. It detects, it detects whether something is there. So maybe a, a simple solution will be, uh, will be to a simple camera detection to detect whether someone is walking to an un unauthorized area. And, last of, and lastly, segmentation. We try to segment uh, different, uh, different things in an image. So as you can see, this is able to segment to, uh, two cats and one dog inside one image. While detection mainly uh, focuses on different uh, di differentiating between two, uh, two objects. So as you can tell in the detection model, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of confusion in the model because there are more than two types of one particular item. While in segmentation, the model is able to distinguish between the two uh, the, the two different pets. And hence you can, you can tell the difference in the lines and the drawing of the shape. All right. And the whole theory on how, how this computer vision model works is based, in, is based on this principle called computational neural networks. It's the whole map behind the, this model works. And I'll be sharing with you a little bit behind the theory of, uh, of these CNN models. So CNN is a really complicated process. Um, it, uh, it's really, really complicated. Uh, I don't know fully about it. I mean, and not, and most people, most scientists, even after studying the whole lives on CNN, are uh, still unable to fully comprehend the power of, power of this model. So, so there are many, many different ways we they can implement CNNs, but this is the most common way in which, uh, in which most people use. So it's first of all, it's followed by combinational and pooling layers. And what these two means are, are fun, uh, um, to put it simply, is that there, um, there are some mathematical, it's a mathematical formula to uh, in, uh, in a, that we apply to the pixels to distinguish, uh, yes, in, in this model. So we apply a whole layer of mathematical formulas, combinational pooling, Combination pooling, or, or it can be combination and combination, combination pooling. It doesn't matter. So, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, because, uh, not in the say that it doesn't matter. In the say that we, we, we don't truly know on which uh, on which um uh, which sequence or which pattern is best for the is best for the object. It requires a lot of trial and practice to de uh, to determine which one is best for this specific object. And I'll be sharing a little bit more behind the math behind combination and, and pooling uh, shortly. So don't be worried if you really don't understand what I'm talking about right now. Yes. At the end of the day, our output, uh, the output is Donald, Goofy, and Tweety. As you can tell, the model has 70% confidence that this image, this image that is processing is, which is true. But at the end of the day, it's, end of the day there's only a 70% confidence. So surely this model can be improved in some manner or so. And this is, and this is the man behind combination. It, it works a little bit, uh, uh, to put it simply, it works a little bit like, mm, mm, the thing about it as a matrix multiplication of some sort, if you, you put it in simple terms. So we apply we apply a matrix and we uh, and we and we multiply each kernel separately such that we output one uh, a simpler kernel. So as you can tell, the the kernel on the right is 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 what we call a feature map. The feature map output is only a it's a four, four times four it's a four is in a four times four shape. And our input image is in a six times six times six shape. So the the output is both simpler, but it's not uh, and it it has the information that's provided by the initial input. And this combination helps in, helps for us to combat helps for us to map patterns in the image, and the model has some ways to interpret this our final our final feature map and output the classification as we have seen earlier. Pooling is a little simpler, so there's many many different forms of poolings, but the two main methods of poolings are is max pooling. So as, as you can see in this uh, this original four times four square, max pooling works by taking the largest value. Well, these values are the pixels uh, information in the images, and how max pooling works is by so in this case, in this yellow square, 80 is a larger pixel, so it inputs 80. 36 is the largest in greens, so it takes 36, so and so forth. Average pooling works similarly, but instead of taking a maximum value, we find an average value. So we so we add up all the numbers in this in this uh, in, in this square, and then we average it to get the, the value outwards. And the main, main idea with high both combination and pooling is to Of CV libraries, there's open CV, open computer vision, which is by far one of the most common sort of libraries that we use. Uh, TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is primarily a, a deep learning uh, uh, 
deep learning library, but it's TensorFlow imaging as well, which is pretty high how CB works. So Priyans will be around sharing you a little bit more about uh, MetaPipe, which is another computer vision library. Over to you. Yeah, so now we've, now we've talked about the theory behind CNNs and computer vision in general. But now let's move over to a more practical approach and I'll show you an example of the library that we're gonna be using today, MediaPipe. So if we look over here in this link, Google, Google actually allows us to do a real-time demo of their MediaType interface. So for example, we can choose our model and we're choosing to select the efficient net light zero. And that's gonna be the same model that we're gonna use in code. So now let's see what Google has set up for us. Um, yeah. So let's say I put an object over here. I'm gonna put an orange and it actually detects that we have an orange. So as you see over here, the, the confidence that this is an orange changes a bit because this is a video image. This is not a still image. And we can do that, we can do the same for other tasks. So let's say that I have a photo, it still detects, an iPod, iPod is pretty close. Uh, it also detects that it might be a cellular telephone, which is basically a handphone. And even if I put a mouse, in this case, it didn't detect it, but you know, there's a lot of different objects of similar type. But yeah, this is basically the gist of what MediaPipe has to offer. And Actually, MediaPipe has different functionalities, so it's not it's not just what I showed you just now. What I showed you just now was just an example of image classification, but we have a very but MediaType has various types of things. So, like what like what Tag said in the beginning, we have object detection, we have image segmentation, and many more. So. I encourage you to look at this library in your own time if you want to find out more and we can you can power your apps more easily using media pipe integrations. And yeah, we don't only have, we don't only have vision, but we have text and we have audio. So now we've learned the power of media pipe. But now Priyansh will show you how can we actually use it. So moving on to you to the collab demo. Uh all right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jack. Uh Okay, cool. So now we'll actually see how exactly we translate all of this to code, right? And what we'll be using today is also the MediaPipe uh, library. So you guys can go ahead and scan this QR code for the template. And maybe we'll wait for two minutes so that everyone is on, like, uh, on point. And basically the way we'll be going about this is setting up the MediaPipe and the model, and then we have some visualization functions. And then we have the main part where we fetch the images and then try to classify them. Yeah, all right. So. Right now, when you're going through the link and scanning the QR code, if you're done, can you just give it a reaction so that we're gonna know when everyone has already been set up and then we can proceed to do the collab demo. So just do a thumbs up, okay. Okay, we have one person all set. To, okay, also the link has been sent in the chat as well for those of you who need it. So, <clears throat> right, and uh, just like before we move on to the demo itself, uh, we'll be using the same classification model that uh, John told us about as well, right? So moving on to how exactly we'll be going about um, making our classification, right, is, um, all right. So if you all go on to the notebook, um, you can see 
uh, sort of like a layout like this, right? And to really work on this, um, you can go ahead and make a copy of it, right? Um, you can in GitHub or uh, the most immediate, like easy way to work with it is to make a copy in Google Drive, just like that. And it will take you to a new page. So with that, um, uh, we'll be modifying it uh, in the original template itself. So <clears throat> you can go ahead and connect um, your uh, workspace to one of the computing engines as well. Um, all right. So, all right. Hopefully everyone is set by now. And what we can go, uh, what we can do right now is go ahead and set up our libraries that we need. So we'll be using pip to install MediaPipe just like this in this cell. And you can press control, like command enter or control enter, or simply just click on this to run it. And it will basically install the library for you. And once you're done with that, uh, what we can do um, next is we need to install the model that we'll be using through MediaPipe. So again, we can just go ahead and run the code. And okay, cool. So as you guys can see, uh, this model you uh, you can probably see here in the folder on the left. It's a pflight file. So that's it actually for the setup. It's uh, that simple because all we need are two things, the model and media pipe itself. And Colab will handle the rest. So uh, could you all just give a thumbs up if we can move forward or if you have any issues, can ask question or drop a text maybe? Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Can awesome. yeah. yeah. just move ahead. So, just as a side note, I guess turn on the cameras just to make it more interactive. So, please do. All right. So, meanwhile, right, um, going at, uh, we have some helper functions which will uh, essentially help us um, visualize our images later on. So, for, for this workshop, we've actually implemented all of this already. And uh, two main functions here are uh, display one image, which displays one image. And then you can also display a batch of images uh, with their corresponding predictions. So we'll be using this later on to help us basically visualize everything in a nice way, right? So moving on, the next step, right, is to uh, fetch the images, which is, um, you can do this in three ways, right? And um, the first way is to basically just um, fetch everything from the internet. So this is actually uh, making an API call to the uh, Google's API, right, for, for their sample images. So this is one way that you can go about it. And the other way, right, is if perhaps you want to temporarily test all your own files, you can upload them here on uh, on your collab session. So for that, you can just quite literally just draw, uh, drag and drop it and run this. So it will pick up all the all the files that you have, right? Now, perhaps the most convenient way would be simply, you know, reading them from a folder because this way you can not just work on collab, you can also work locally or in any other operating system as well. So for this, what we'll be doing is we can go ahead and make a new folder. Um, and let's call it images, right? And in this folder, uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be uploading some images um, like these. And it gives you a warning. Uh, so yeah, this is basically saying that uh, as soon as you close, close the entire session, your files would be gone because, well, it's a temporary session after all. So with that, we actually have uploaded all the images. For this uh, workshop, we'll be using three images, like a dog, a pizza, and a tiger. So that being said, how exactly do we go about reading these and working with these images? 
for that, what we can do is uh, primarily what we need is to load them into our session. So we'll go ahead and make a list called file names, or well, image file names, just like that. And we need to set the directory as well to access the images folder that we made. Right. And this would be called images folder. Okay. Now you might want to uh, specify your path here as well. So in this case, our image folder is right here. Uh, um, it's in the root itself, so we can do this. But maybe if you have a relative uh, relative path, you can go ahead and do something like this. If you have nested folders or whatever. So in our case, we just need this, and we could go ahead and iterate through the files in the folder, or the files in this case are images. Right? What we do is we iterate through these um, for file name in R. So now we have a simple for loop going on for us. Um, what we need to do is we need to check whether the file itself is an image or not, right? So check for images is what we do next. For that, we can use a simple command that Python provides us, which is called nsuth, I think. So this itself takes an argument like this. So it can accept like JPG files, or we can have more flexibility. And maybe PNG files as well. Cool. So now that we check for the images and let's say uh, our file name turns out to be an image, what we want to do is we want to um, construct the full path of this, right? Which is relative to the OS. So we can go ahead and s dot join images folder. So this is why we made the directory folder earlier. So we go ahead and append it to this particular thing. File name, just like that. And here, what we're doing is constructing two parts. Uh, oh, so we can go ahead and also append it in the image file names that we made earlier. And we'll be using this list later on to do basically everything that we're doing right now. Right? Uh, the list store parts of image files. Oops. So, which files drop in a uh, file path, basically. Now, we also want to know that uh, whatever we did was fine or not. So, we can just go ahead and print uh, images we found and can just print the entire directory. And if we run this, uh, we found these images, right? The results can be seen here. So that's how we basically load it from our local folder, or in this case, from the Colab local. So um, I guess can move ahead. If anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the text chat. Okay, cool. Now, the thing is that we know that these images are loaded, but we also want to see them, right? Um, this is like more of an optional case. Like we can go ahead and directly go on to classify these, but perhaps uh, if we want to like also see what we are doing, right? So for the sake of that, what we can do is also visualize our images. So for this, we also have this boilerplate code right here and a helper function, which uh, basically resizes images and displays them. It basically sets the aspect ratio for each of them. And for our case, we can have, let's say, a desired height of 500 and desired width of 500 as well that we need, right? <clears throat> and after all of this, what we need to do is um, essentially load these images and then store them um, in a dictionary so that we have essentially the um, 
image name and the loaded image, the key value pair essentially. So for that, we can go ahead and make an images dictionary. And we can load each and every okay, image name. So just like that, uh, we essentially have done what we wanted to do, right? What this function does is it loads an image for a particular um, path or file name that you specify, right? Um, okay. Um, okay. This is basically doing the same thing. So now that we've loaded everything, we also want to see. So for this, uh, ideally we want a result like this, which is you have the image path and the image. So like if I just run images right now, or well, let's see what we get. It's probably gonna be a bit messy. And it's taking a while to do that should be happening. Um, so. Oh, I think of my runtime disconnected. Okay, cool. Yep, so uh, this gives us like a very, really like messy value, right? So what we want to do is organize it in a much more uh, easy way so that we can see as well. So what we go, what we do here is we go through the dictionary and what we um, essentially have to do is for name and images and images dot items, um, items, um, we want to print the file name like this and we want to display the image also resize for this we call this helper function or resize and show, resize and show image size and show image and this should be image okay Cool. So let's go ahead and run this. So we've actually managed to successfully um, display our images in a more uh, readable and like watchable way, right? Uh, that's like the path and the images that we loaded earlier in our folder. So that's dog and that's a nice pizza right there. So we've almost like done all the three major steps that we needed to do. Right, and the fourth most important step is actually classification. In this aspect, what we are really expecting is our model to essentially tell us what exactly, how exactly do we classify it, and what to classify it into. So this is like the uh, ideal result that we want, right? Uh, it tells us that it's tiger with, um, that's like the confidence, sort of like that. So it's. 0.8 confidence, the value is always between zero and one. So and um, uh, for a dog, this is a dog breed, um, looks similar to golden, like um, golden retrievers, but it's not the same. So that, and how do we achieve this? Well, um, there are five important steps um, for classification, which is first we make a classifier object, then we need to load the input image and we classify. But just classification is not enough. We get a lot of garbage value like this. And what we need to, I mean, these are helpful values, but what we need to do is, of course, uh, process this output and visualize it. So in that aspect, what we can do is um, make our classifier object. So for this, uh, is, before even making it, what we need to do is specify the base options that we need for a classifier object. 
right and base option is model has so we need to specify which model we are using and in our case it's the classifier which we downloaded earlier uh, okay right and once we are done um, we need to set some more options um, so options what this basically means is essentially also setting the options for our model essentially uh, and what we did here was specify the path for options what we do is image not image classifier okay image classifier options and we can specify our base option right here which we made earlier and like this and the other thing that we need to specify is how many results we want so let's take the results as four now once we're done with this um oh, that's not supposed to be indented indented okay so <clears throat> Once we are done with this, uh, we can go ahead and make our actual classifier object, right? So for that, essentially um, what we do is uh, classifier object, object from the options that we specified. Right? So let's go ahead and make our classifier. Uh, vision not image classifier dot create um, options options um great um with this we have the step two complete right So oh, this is supposed to be a capital F right there. Okay. Good. And the next step is making uh, loading the input images, right? And since we need to load them somewhere, what we uh, do is we make another list, right? Um, and we also need to have a list for the predictions that we'll make later. So uh, what we'll be doing here is essentially calling the helper function that we made earlier, which takes in as parameter images and predictions and displays them in a nice fashion, which is why uh, we do this. Okay. And how exactly do we load? Um, for this, uh, again, we iterate through each image in the ones which we loaded earlier, right? And equals uh, the image from the file and uh, now we call media pipe image dot create from file okay so what this does is tells media pipe to actually make the image from the file that we had earlier so that you can pass it into the model and classify and with this, um, what we do is the next step is classify, classification. So that's basically step four that we are doing right now. Classify is classification. Result is we call the classifier object, and it's a simple method called classifier image that we loaded earlier. So now your model will classify this image and what we need to do is also prim a little bit of this. So uh, actually what we can do right now is actually just go ahead and print out this result and see what we get. Classification result. So what this gives us is 
um, a result like this, right? So it's a very complicated result that we have for each particular image. As you can see, we have the category name here and uh, the breed of the dog and what pizza is, right? So we need to make this, uh, we need to process this as well, right? And that's basically what our step five is, process the result. And in this case, it's also to visualize it. Um, for this, we can go ahead and, oh, my runtime disconnected. Okay, it's back. So what we need is um, to get the top category for, category for, each so classification result dot classification and get the first value and also get the first value from the category right and once this is done we can add it to the results the predictions basically um, oh, and we can update predictions like that. And okay, oh, let's format it a little bit as well. So string, and what we pass in as parameter is our category that we want. So top category dot the name of the category, right? And um, Besides this, uh, we also want to have the score, like the confidence with which we can say uh, that this particular image is a tiger, that this particular image is a tiger or is, you know, food essentially. So this has a score parameter. Now, one thing to realize is that this score can be quite big, so we can round it off as well. Or uh, just like that, to two decimal places, we can round it off, right? And now we can use the method, the helper function right here to visualize our results, this one. So we can copy that and <clears throat> we can display the results here, predictions. So one thing to also note here is that we also have to append the images to the list, right? So that we can show it. And if you go ahead and run this, and as you guys can see, uh, it successfully classifies each um, image properly. So this is a tiger with um, 0.8. I think that's the confidence interval or more like the score with which we can say that this is actually a tiger. And this is a dog. It's a specific breed, uh, breed called uh, Kuvas, I think. And this is a pizza. <clears throat> so with that, um, our code is essentially complete. Within four steps, we have managed to classify um, our images, right? <clears throat> And one thing to note here is um, the usability is really up to you. You can, uh, since we are storing these locally, we can also integrate this program into other programs as well. So, so this is essentially a good start for our classification projects. And with that, we come to the end of the demo. So I think John would like to take over now. Yeah, so thank you so much, Priyansh, for your demo. Now we've we've learned a lot over the past uh over the past workshop. And now we're gonna move over, over to our quiz time so that we can actually implement what we've learned so far. Right. So there was difficulty setting the zoom poll. So uh you can treat this quiz as either a review or you can type in the chat so that so that it can be more inter interactive. But without further ado, let's start with our quiz. So our first one's gonna be, which one is not an application of computer vision? 
we have facial recognition, autonomous vehicles, NLP, and medical image analysis. Okay, we have an answer. We have two, three and three. Yep. So what we choose actually number three, because if we look at IBM's def the definition of computer vision, it's the field AI that takes information from images or videos or other types of media input, and we get to learn from those images. But for natural language processing, it's more on how do you how do you process, as the name implies, natural data. So it's how you talk naturally and making sure that the machine understands what you're talking about. All right, great. Let's move on to the next question. Now, what does CNN stand for? Tech has shown this a bit, but we have computerized neural network, convolutional, conventional, and complete. And yep, everyone got it. So CNN stands for the convolutional neural network. And as, and as tech said, the CNN was actually very, very important in the development of computer vision because it boosted the performance of neural networks to be able to understand images by a long shot. All right, so our next question is a bit more technical and it's something that wasn't really discussed by, wasn't really discussed by tech, but we can apply from his uh, explanations and what he said in the beginning. So which layer in the CNN is used to reduce the spatial dimensions of the image? We have the fully connected layer, the convolutional layer, the activation layer, and the pooling layer. Yes, this is tricky tech. So we can wait for a while. All right, we have some answers. We have we have four, we have two. Some people are saying two. Maybe we can get a few more answers. So when I say reducing the spatial dimensions of the image, we're basically squeezing down the image and reducing the number of features that we're gonna feed on our model. I think we have no more responses. So let's go on to the, to the answer. The answer is actually number four. So Manuel was actually correct. It's actually the, the pooling layer. So number three is actually a trick. Number three is actually a trick because we don't have the activation layer in CNNs. A CNN comprised of three layers, the convolutional layer, as you see over here, the pooling layer, as you see over here, and the fully connected layer. So what do these layers actually do? I'll go back to tag slide and I'll show you. So over here we have different, we have different layers. We have convolutional and pooling layer. And we're, we're gonna be talking about those two first because these two layers are what helps us to extract features from our images. Now, as you know, images are basically a matrix of different pixel values. And if you feed an entire, if you feed an entire image into just a random neural network, you're gonna have too many data points to work with. So what that means is that we have to actually filter out, take in the relevant uh, features from the image, and we want to reduce the size, right? And so taking out the relevant features is actually from convolution. So this is what the convolution step does. We will do an element-wise matrix multiplication, and then we sum them all up. So these values in our filter will, will, help, will, help, us to, will help us to take a path from the image, which is in this case, this three by three section, and output a feature. So for example, let's say that this is a cat's ears, and that's gonna be one of the features that we feed into our network. And so after, now we've gotten our features, we also want to do pooling. So you see over here, pooling. We can do either max pooling or average pooling, but you see that the size will decrease for either of them. So we take a two by two batch, we take the maximum, and so that two by two batch just becomes one pixel. So why does pooling actually work? Can anyone give a suggestion? 
because we're we're gonna reduce the amount of data and the number of features that we're feeding our model. So wouldn't that lose a lot of information? As you see over here, we're cutting four data pins into just one. All right, I see no answers in the chat, so I guess I'll do a short explanation of it. So the answer is actually in something called uh, spatial locality. So what spatial locality actually means is that the pixels are gonna have similar values close to each other. You can even look at my video image right here. Most of my screen is just this white color. They're mostly roughly the same pixels. So even if I take the maximum or if I take the average and reduce it into one, we still retain somewhat a lot of the information that we had in this original image. Or maybe an orange. Most of this is just an orange patch. So we're not actually losing that much information from, uh, from our images. And so now we've actually, we've actually taken out the most relevant features from our image. We've squeezed the image. And that's why we can finally move it into our neural network. And these are going to be inputs for our fully connected layer. So that's why our fully connected layer is basically just your simple neural network. So once again, our, our, convolution, our convolution and our pooling is going to help us to extract features and reduce its size. And our fully connected layer will help us to take in those features and output a result. All right, so next question. It's a bit easier, but who developed MediaPipe? OpenAI, which saw the hype, Meta, Google, and Microsoft. Yep. Uh, as we very heavily promoted it, Google was the one developing MediaPipe. So they created MediaPipe because they want a way to democratize machine learning, and we want to have a way to easily uh, deploy machine learning algorithms on our everyday apps, which is why we had this demo. And if you guys found this useful, you can also try to integrate this into your own apps. Yeah. But um, all of these companies are pretty involved in AI, well, especially number one. And OpenAI actually just released something called Sora. So you can check that out. So OpenAI released a new model that allows you to type in what you want and they can produce a video from it. So it's an upgrade from what they had from Dali. Yep, tag send the link. All right, so what model architecture did we use for our media pipe demo? We have EfficientNet, we have ResNet, we have YOLO V8, and we have AlexNet. All right, so we did use EfficientNet for our model. As you see over here from the code that Priyanshi gave. And that's it for a quiz. So does anyone have any more Q&As? Uh, anything about ranging from the theory from computer vision or how to actually use MediaPipe to integrate and empower your apps using machine learning? So we're gonna be taking questions from the floor. You can just type it in the chat or you can turn on your mic and we can discuss. All right, I see nothing coming in, so if that's it, if that's it, then it takes us to the end of our workshop. Thank you so much for coming. And we're hope, we hope that you learned something. If, for example, you have different questions, uh, if you have different questions about what we discussed or you need help understanding the, the code or the demo, you can reach out to us for help.